Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nell Pepper, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so very excited to introduce this virtual event with Melissa Lozada Oliva, presenting her debut novel, Dreaming of You, in conversation with Sadie Dupuy. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community. Every week we host events here on our Zoom account and our fall events calendar is chock full of fascinating speakers, including acclaimed historian Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, Pulitzer Prize winning poet laureate Tracy K. Smith and famed novelist Ann Patchett in conversation with NPR Scott Simon. Please check out the event schedule on our website at harvard.com slash events. And while you're there, you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at uh, the bottom of your screen or wherever it appears on your screen, and we will get through as many as time allows. This event will have closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom that you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase copies of Dreaming of You on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and of our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore in Harvard Square. We thank all of you so much for showing up and for tuning in, both in support of our authors and of the fantastic staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. We, of course, hope that they don't, but if they do, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And uh, before I introduce our speakers, I'd like you to know that while I will do my best to remain professional this evening, you should just know that I am completely in the tank for Melissa uh, and for this book since we worked as fellow book slingers at Harvard Bookstore. Uh, Melissa Lozada Oliva is the child of Guatemalan and Colombian immigrants. She co-hosts the podcast Say More and is a member of the band Melly and the Specs. She holds an MFA in poetry from NYU and her writing has been featured in Remezcla, Paper, The Guardian, The Breakbeat Poets, Volume 4, Wirecutter, Vulture, Bustle, Glamour, The Huffington Post, Muzzle Magazine, The Poetry Project, Audible, and DBC Mundo. Sadie Dupuy is the guitarist, songwriter, and singer of the rock band Speedy Ortiz, as well as the producer and multi-instrumentalist behind the pop project Sad 13. Sadie heads the record label Wax 9, edits its poetry journal, and has written for outlets including Spin, Nylon, and Playboy. She holds an MFA in poetry from UMass Amherst, where she also taught writing. Mouth Guard, her first book, was published in 2018, and her most recent album is Sad 13's Haunted Painting, which came out in 2020. Tonight, they'll be discussing Melissa's new book, Dreaming of You, a novel in verse. In Dreaming of You, a lonely poet named Melissa brings Tejano pop star Selena back from the dead. A Greek chorus of chismosas guides the reader on a phantasmic trek through New York City celebrity worship the way that listening to your favorite song feels like listening to your memory of having listened to your favorite song, Latinidad and the horror of being seen. And now I am thrilled to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Melissa and Sadie. Hi, Melissa. Hi. Okay, the ghost Melissa your, came back. Your ghost I don't know is who... entering the chat. <laughs> That is really unsettling. I think it's like we diabolical. should welcome it. I think um, it fits in with many things yeah. in this wonderful book. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. <laughs> um, cool. So I well, can first of all, also know I want to, yeah. No, you go, go. ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, I like the phrase in the, in the bucket. And I want to say it more <laughs> completely in the bucket. 
I'm turned on fandom for uh, Dreaming of You, personally. Yeah. <laughs> um, are you going to read to to us from it first before we dive into cool. questions? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. So I'm going to... Also, I'm wearing a wig because Sadie said she was wearing a wig. And it's really ridiculous, but it's kind of fun. It um, really good. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to just read the poem where Selena's brought back to life. But first, I think I'll just read like a bit from the Greek chorus of Chismosas. Um, we're like introducing Melissa, um, kind of going crazy. Zombies are so totally out and basically a fear mongering tool to get you to filter your water or not vaccinate your kids. We are not saying we don't trust the government, not this time. This time we are saying, don't you ever feel like people would care about you more if you were dead? Um, okay, and then they say, you should never bring somebody back from the dead. Hasn't everybody seen the remake of Pet Cemetery, Jesu Cristo? And this poem is called Resurrecting Selena. Ooh, what happened? I think it's on your, it's your ghost talking. Oh, <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> so scary. Um, so this poem is called Resurrecting Selena. My reasoning, because it is not enough to be seen, because I need to see, because I miss her even though I've never met her, because it had to be me, because if it wasn't, then it would have been somebody else, the medium. I'm tired of feedback and I'm addicted to the internet. If someone else gets involved, it would just be too messy. I need flowers, I need a moonlight dance, I need a song to sway to and access to Wi-Fi. I do some research, I go down YouTube holes, I come up with my own method. How I brought Selena back. One, grow out my hair, purchase chunky gold hoops, buy some bright red lipstick that will stain, this is mainly for effect, but it can't hurt. Two, I sing backward into a recording device and then play the recording device backward. Three, I can't tell my friends anything about this because they would think I'm nuts. Four, so I get rid of my friends. Five, I take out a loan and turn my bedroom into a lab. I take a USB drive full of Selena's images, songs, and interviews and put it into a pot of my period blood. After three weeks, roots begin to grow at its ends. I set up a table. I draw a figure on the table using lipstick. Six, I sing backward into a recording device and then play the recording device backwards. Seven, there's more to do. I wake you up and I ask you to think of, to quickly think of the name of the girl in elementary school with the prettiest handwriting. Eight, I walk into the kitchen, tie a red string around my finger, say this girl's name five times while spraying fabuloso into the air. You walk in on me and are all, what are you doing? Nine, I spray you in the face because I'm a reactive person. 10, I run away because I'm a reactive person. 11, I come back because I thought about what I've done. 12 days go by finally it is midnight and storming i take the usb out of the pot of period blood and i put it in some soil i add fertilizer i've never been good at waiting 13 there is a cracking in the air the walls are vibrating and i'm holding the whole room together i am on the ceiling and underneath the basement floor there's a rapid knocking on the sliding screen door a scream coming from the pot my cat hisses the lights turn on and off I'm in the closet spying and outside of the closet feeling like I'm being watched. Now it is midnight. I open a girl-shaped door. The knob holds my hand. A cloud of pink is in front of me, rising from the table, the kind of stuff that leaks from attics. I put my hand in and scream, 13A. Now I'm in a white dress running among the trees. You are behind me holding up a jukebox and it's playing something with drums. 13B, you lose me among the trees. I hear you calling my name. I want you to keep chasing me and I don't want you to know how far I would go to find out the truth of something, to scratch an itch that will tear the whole universe open. I'm sorry about this, but I'm not sorry about this. I'm already lighting the candles. I'm drawing a circle in the dirt with salt. I'm taking off my shoes. I'm already feeling the dirt beneath my feet dance. Yay. Thank you for uh, Thanks. giving us the big, <laughs> the big spoiler that uh, 
for everyone who has not read this book 24 hours after pub day that <laughs> you melissa Lizardo, Oliva, are gonna resurrect uh selena and that's kind of the the central yeah. uh, plot point of this novel <laughs> universe um so that she's most to say it yes. in the, the portion you just read and you've given interviews also where like this is the number one rule it's not a good idea to resurrect someone um i want i want to twist this this mm -hmm. never do this uh question to get you to be introspective yeah what what are the rules that you broke mm. for yourself in writing this book whoa <laughs> sorry. Um... sorry it's all gotcha questions <laughs> from here down <laughs> um I think well I feel like a big role was like I made poet I was like writing these like personal poems and then I was like turning them into fiction. Um, and I think I was like writing this like uh, reality fiction line. And maybe the rule that I broke was like being, um, I feel like I was always honest, but I wasn't always like telling the, I didn't have to like tell the truth anymore. Um, to, or like it'd have to be like accurate, like a scientist. <laughs> I could just be like a mad scientist and, um, you know, Frankenstein somebody. Um, and I don't know, I, I think uh, there's a lot of like forms in this book. There's like sonnets and contrapuntals and those are very like rule heavy. Um, but like doing that kind of like allowed me to say more than I was able to because like there's like constraint and stuff. Um, and then I think, I mean, maybe the biggest thing is like it's, um, I was like in my MFA program and no one is like telling me to I'm write a novel in verse or like tell a story through poems. So I feel like that was, I don't know. Am I breaking, I don't know if I break the rules that much, I'm a Virgo, but you live and die by them <laughs> and then also resurrect i'd love I, I, <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so speaking of, of it being a novel in verse which i know we'll get into you characterize it a different way than that also um but i'm curious mm. if there are other verse novels that were inspiring to you while you were working on this and carson's kind of the, the person that comes to mind for me but uh, as a former bookseller if you were working a Harvard bookstore today, what are some some novels in verse you'd you'd recommend? Ooh, um, this is so bad. I like I read this novel in verse that is like very obscure that my friend lent me, and I'm gonna sound like an annoying customer, but I don't remember. It was red. Um, the color of the book was red, um, and. And it was just like, it was like another spooky novel in verse. And I like literally should, I should have had that written down. Um, but I think, I mean, there, I guess they're like having a, a comeback moment, like Elizabeth Acevedo. There's, uh, there's a lot of novel in verses for um, like YA, um, uh, like teens. And I think that also has been the case for a while. Uh, one of my favorite things that I didn't understand was a novel in verse. I just thought it was like short writing, <laughs> but it's this book called What My Mother Doesn't Know by Sonia Sones. And it came out in like the early 2000s. And it's just about this like horny girl in Cambridge, Massachusetts who falls in love with this nerd and they go to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and it's written um, in I verse. can't relate to that and story. What'd you say? I said I can't relate personally to that exact story. Did yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. As soon as someone says Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, yeah, so I think that was just like of my youth. I don't I don't know. I don't read um, many. I was reading. I, I like listened to a lot of rock operas as a child, as a teen. Um, and those felt maybe more informative. Well, this was my next question, because you've been characterizing this book as a rock opera. And mm -hmm. I'm curious, what were the ones that were formative mm -hmm. for you that, that feel resonant um, or like a, have a kinship to this story? Yeah, okay. 
Um, so as a as someone who grew up after um, as someone who was eight years old when 9-11 happened, um, the rock operas of my youth are American Idiot, Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge, and Hot Fuss. Um, so that's Green Day, My Chemical Romance, and The Killers. Um, and all of those albums, I mean, I guess they're more like concept albums. I think American Idiot is more exclu exclusively like a rock opera. Um, they're all about like men who go through these like journeys to hell and back. Um, and I thought that was cool. I also thought it was, my professor told me that like, you know, um, with a novel in verse, sometimes the poetry doesn't get to sing. So, you know, with those albums, like all of those stand out by themselves, even when they're telling a story. So that was important for me writing this. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, okay, let's let's fast mm -hmm. forward into the future. One year from now, the pandemic is far over, and uh, dreaming of you. It's done. <laughs> is is opening on Broadway. Uh, is this going to be solely oh, no. soundtracked by Selena <laughs> or is this more of a jukebox musical? Were there other, were there some other musical influences that, that got stirred into the pot here? Whoa, what a good question. I feel like if there were Selena songs, they would have to be like covered um, into another genre or something. Um, but then maybe it would be like a jukebox musical um there's a whole soundtrack that I made to I just keep getting glimpses of myself in the wig and like I want to laugh um I'm like, I love it's it so I think it's a good forth. wig for you like, <laughs> it's like uneven um so what was I gonna say yeah I have a, I have a soundtrack. soundtrack that's yeah. mm -hmm. it's on Spotify and it is um I think chronologically what is going on in the book starts off with hooray for the riffraffs hungry ghosts ends with i'll be seeing you by billy holiday um yeah that's an excellent uh progression I, I can't wait to find out what's in between and i hope we can get a, a link posted in the <laughs> chat at some point tonight um so i want to go back to to you talking about yeah, these are like yeah. some personal poems that you maybe didn't have to be 100% uh, truthful to your history. And and I know that even prior mm -hmm. to writing this book, Selena has been a topic in your poetry for like a decade. So I'm curious, mm -hmm. not only like what's the timeline for this manuscript, when when is the first poem from, but were there other poems that, that didn't at first make sense for this book that you were able to um, weave into this narrative? Yeah. Sorry, that's like three questions um, in one, but. I think the first Selena poem. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. I think um, the first Selena poem I ever wrote was in undergrad and it was this like weird persona poem where she's like talking to me through a TV. Um, and my professor really hated it and everyone really hated it. Um, and it was just like all about like nostalgia and I didn't really know. I was like, this is so good. I don't even remember what the fuck it was called. And then that kind of like laid to rest. Um, and I, like the first one I wrote was like zombie Selena goes to the Halloween party. And it was kind of like campy and like her body was like falling apart. Um, and she was this like traditional zombie. Um, and I was really fascinated with like this idea of like her coming to this Halloween party and everyone is like, how did you get this costume so good? And it, she's like, it's cause it's really me. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I also like Yolanda, the woman who plays Yolanda Saldivar and Yolanda Sal in the Selena movie has played a maid um, over a hundred times. So, I wrote this poem called Yolanda Saldivar Gets Away With It. And it's this like alternate universe where she kills Selena and then kills a maid, steals her uniform and then like goes off into the sun. Um, but that didn't really make a lot of sense with um, what was going on in the book. So I changed it to like Yolanda Saldivar um, 
breaks out of prison. Um, and then poems that like didn't really have uh, anything to do with the book, but I made do with this book. Um, there's all these just like love poems that I fit in here. Um, there's a poem in here called like poem for fucking a fish that I wrote like way before the Selena manuscript started that um, I felt fit in because it's about um, it's based off of like the shape of water and also about like putting people on the like, love on a pedestal and then not like um, and kind of having this like rose cause rose colored uh, glasses about how like ugly um, they can be. Um, yeah. I remember, I remember seeing you read that poem at Rubelod maybe like three yeah. years ago. Um, yeah, I love yeah. that you were able to to bring that into this narrative when the the capital YU is replaced by the the monster. Um, mm -hmm. I want to ask about that choice. You you mentioned pretty early in the book you invoke like a professor who says that using the second person is useless. Um, and I'm curious about <laughs> kind of like invoking the institutional world of poetry um, and whether there were takeaways from your MFA of like things you learned that you don't want to do, if that makes sense. It, it felt like, um, mm. yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that kind of like meta commentary because it felt very uh, like invoking the institutional and then moving away from it for the rest of the book intentionally. Yeah, I like, um, I was saying this earlier, I like don't, I don't remember writing a lot of these poems. So I don't remember who said that. Um, but I also remember feeling um, like offended because I always write um, to the second person. And I think, you know, I feel like I couldn't have written this book if I wasn't in, in an MFA program because I had a lot of like support from like my classmates and my advisor. Um, I think at the same time, like there's all these like traditional things that you learn in poetry school um, and it shapes how you read and how you write, like whether you like it or not. And it like, sh it tries to shape your taste, whether you like it or not. And like, I came in as this like slam poet who was just like, yeah, I don't know. I don't think about like craft at all. Sorry. Um, I like watching movies, da da da. Um, and I I think I was I was like shocked at how <laughs> how like how many rules there are in poetry school, um, despite it being like poetry being like the most free thing. Um, but then also like I think poets are, are so obsessed with talking about a you. Um, because we love thinking about things romantically or elegiacally. We're always like looking to the past or like this future that we have with somebody else. And sometimes the you is just like, we're talking to ourselves, like maybe as children. Um, and yeah, I think, I mean, yeah, I also, I was thinking about that with like the show you and how his like gaze towards like women shifts and how like his wife is sometimes his wife whose name is love like sometimes he's like calling her love and sometimes he's calling her you and then like it's like he is like shifting his um like attention towards her i don't know it's very poetic i think poets do that i think we all do that anyway a uh, big big fan of tv show you in fact uh. Yes. I was I was happy that I had a show get rained out recently so I could stay in all day and finish season three. Um, I want to know <laughs> about your so so I I understand that you have been a fan of Selena since seeing the big old movie. Uh, same here. Yeah. But I'm curious what your research process was like for this because you're certainly invoking um, interviews and like theories about. Selena and Yolanda and her father um, that are not from the movie. So t tell us what your research yeah. is like. Um, so for some reason, it was very important to me to like not watch the movie again um, because I didn't want, I don't know, it, maybe it was just like too close to home or something, or I just didn't want it to like, I really wanted to like, like sit with my memories of it. 
Um, and I, you know, because it's fiction, I didn't want things to be like historically accurate. Okay, this is what I did for research. I read this book called Selenidad by Deborah Paredes. And she talks about like Selena in relation to like the shape of Latina identity. And she had this like really important chapter about Yolanda Saldivar, where she talks about how Yolanda Saldivar um, is, you know, like shaped by patriarchy and so is Selena. And maybe Selena died because of the patriarchy, because of all the things that like Yolanda, um, you know, couldn't have and all the, all of the ways Selena was like trying to be nice because of her father, who was this like the ultimate patriarchal figure. Um, so that was really important for me to read. My, Zoe Walls um, sent it to me because she like found it at the Harvard Bookstore Warehouse and was like, I know you're like writing the Selena book, you should read this. And it was very, very helpful. Um, there are these Selena sonnets where I take, um, so like Selena can only speak in how she has spoken before. So I watched a compilation of her interviews on, on YouTube and I just wrote down things that stuck out to me and I put them in a sonnet form, which is 14 lines, 10 syllables a line. Um, and yeah, I, it was like, I don't know, that was like one of the sadder poems to me because I was just like, like it's an echo of like who she used to be and she has like no control. The dead have like no control over how they're remembered. Um, and I think that might have been it in terms of research. There's a lot of after poems in there. Um, uh, the main resurrection poem is after a Terence Hayes poem called Instructions for a Seance with Vladimir, where he brings the literary Vladimir's back to life um, through a seance. And yeah, yeah. I had no idea Deborah Perez wrote a book about Selena. I, I really like her book, poetry book from last year, and you mm. can find that one. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad yeah. you invoked the like poems in Selena's voice because I, I guess this is gonna be more of a compliment than a question. But I, uh, yeah, I thought that was a really powerful choice to kind of remix existing lines and language from her. And I also love yeah. the typographical choice you did, where like. In the book, you kind of describe resurrected Selena as busy, like TV static, and then the font is kind of um, double printed. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm curious about. Yeah. I'm glad the, you like, like that. I, you know, love all the font choices always. Um, I'm curious about formatting choices you made <laughs> across this book because not only do we do you make that choice of. Um, Selena's voice being kind of this like double, triple, hazily printed thing. Um, but we see things in script format. We see things in prose format, interview format. Uh, mm. We got an email yeah. with all kinds of exclamation points. How did you decide um, how <laughs> formatting would play into the narrative? Yeah. Um, I think I really just wanted to have fun a lot with the format. And also this book is so much about like seeing people for all of the selves inside of them. So I think um, I didn't want any, I didn't want this book to just be like one thing I wanted, uh, you know. So yeah, the script format, the, the poem A Star is Born Again is in this like, um, it's like two pages of a script. And uh, for that one, I think I really wanted to um, like break apart this like movie gaze that Melissa has over her life and the uh, Selena's resurrected life um, and really just like showcase this like disappointment that she feels when um, this doesn't really spoil stuff but like when Selena like decides to go on without her um, and so that was yeah a form that I, I wanted to play with and I I think Basically, I really like forms where um, people can talk to each other. So I found that like I could use the sonnet form as a way for like two people to talk to each other in this like kind of limited staticky way. And then the contrapuntal form um, for people to like show like the duality of what people are saying. 
Um, and I think generally there's just like a lot of dialogue in my poems, a lot of people just like, uh, people's like, I, I really, the stuff people say to me like bangs around in my head forever. Um, and I always, you know, a lot of poems are like inspired by things that people have like said verbatim. Um, so I think it's almost like, it's like, uh, yeah, my friend once said that, um, uh, what is it? It's like remixing something or the Selena sonnets are like uh, sampling. Um, and yeah, I think that's interesting. <laughs> I think that's really cool. Um, hi, Lavender. Yeah. Jesus, this dog really wants to talk to you. Um, <laughs> so you oh. also uh, structured the book in sections based on lyrics from Como La Flor. And I'm mm -hmm. curious if there are, I'm curious what other parts of Selena's work dictated choices like that. Are there other Easter eggs that I can look out for when I reread so I can feel smart? Ooh, um, probably, I think, so yeah, the, I was really struck by how in Como La Flor, she says, me marcho hoy, which means I wither today. Um, and how she is talking about how heartbroken she is, but also that really felt like, um, like death to me. Um, so, uh, I think definitely that song is a huge part of it. There's a, a there's things of like dreaming of you. Um, there's a lot of like allusions to dreaming and sleeping and um, how like much in that song she is talking about the beauty of like imagining someone that she loves and wants to run away with. Um, I was really inspired by the music video of that song too, which was released after she died. Um, there's just this like lonely girl um, dreaming about Selena and Selena's like watching her from a TV and then the girl like leaves, like kisses her dad goodnight and then leaves in the middle of the night with um, her boyfriend. And it's supposed to be like, she's like going and running away, you know, with the, the love of her life, but it also really feels like death like she is it's like Selena saying goodbye to her father and then like going off into this death car um I think there's more in here oh I mean the disco medley I was a huge um that her if you, you can like watch her like live disco medley at Astrodome um there's a bunch of stuff for it in there um the lipstick on her microphone um there's a little so in the, the live at Astrodome, she has like lipstick on her microphone. So then on the cover, there's like lipstick on a microphone. Oh, that's if awesome. You look closely. I'll, I'll pull up my yeah. own copy. Yeah, yeah. that looks great. <laughs> yeah. Um, what did I want to tell? What did I, I want to ask you questions. What are they? Um, Let's see, let's see. I'm trying to think because I know we, we have to get to some audience questions too, so I don't want to take up all my time, all of everyone's time with my nerdy questions. Um, so you have <laughs> described this work as like genre adjacent, which I really like. Um, and I know that, I mean, there's horror, there's like humor, there's obviously a lot of love. Um, and I know that I, I've seen some of your literary influences on this but I'm curious if there's anyone who's inspired that kind of cross genre approach that might surprise us, um, comedians or filmmakers, or you already mentioned you, mm. I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I think, honestly, Jamie Loftus, I think really inspired me right while writing this. Jamie. And just like how, um, is she in the chat? Um, is she here? Hello. Um, Hi, but also Jamie, like her stuff can be so like, Hey, Hey, Jamie. <laughs> um, it, her stuff is so like funny and also like macabre and, uh, like going like really like scratching at a, a scab, um, in a way that is like necessary. Um, so yeah, I think I, I really love how she, also doesn't she's this like hybrid person not really like 
fitting in with um, like, you know, maybe like a journalist and everything she does, even when it's like comedy. Um, she's just so meticulous. Love you, Jamie. Um, I think Kelly Link was a big inspiration. Um, uh, I think the movie Pet Cemetery was a big inspiration. Um, Which pops up. I didn't in the read book the book. Too. Oh yeah, yeah you <laughs> already. They know. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, I was. I was the. I was Churchill the cat one year for Halloween, the resurrected cat. Um. And oh, I mean, there's this Black Mirror episode that uh, really inspired me, where that woman gathers all of the information from her boyfriend's to be a clone. Um, it's like one of the first Black Mirror episodes. I'm just a child of the, the internet. Um, yeah. That's funny you mentioned the Black Mirror episode because when it, I didn't like read my, my full notes for my question, but I feel like drawing from the public record and the way the internet enables anyone to do that, um, like facilitates mm. a kind of resurrection that we all do every day, even with people who are living. Uh, so I guess I could tie this wow. into another question, which is so much of the book touches on fandom. And I'm curious how your experience with internet fans helped you tell mm. both Selena and Yolanda's stories and also helped you put yourself in the headspace of a fan who would like, lose themselves in a resurrection spell. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, yeah, it's it's kind of a bizarre experience, like having fans. My friend once told me I'm like situationally famous um, and not like, like I'm like, oh, like a certain sector of people will recognize me because of a specific thing. <laughs> Um, that might be poetry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which you touch on a lot in True. the book, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it it's hard because I really like attention. And then I think at some point I was getting a lot of attention and it was making me really anxious. And I was really worried about messing up and um, so somebody being like disillusioned with me um I had something to say I also like am like such a fan girl and I think that is I think it's important for all of us to like um be fans and sometimes not cross the line of like meeting someone that who you're a fan of because it is like it's like you've made them into like a tiny god in your head and then all of a sudden they become real and it is important to remember that people are real but I think we all need things to like worship. Um, and, you know, maybe that's complicated, but um, yeah, I mean, I also like have, I've had people be like so nice to me about my work and be like this really like um, influenced and changed me. And then like on the other half being people being like, I mean, my Twitter header for a long time was like, Melissa Lozada Oliva, if you're reading this, your poetry sucks. <laughs> um or people like one time Olivia and I got this like playlist about um and it was called girls who should die and it was just like music about killing women and it was really horrifying um one time somebody had to be like escorted away from one of my shows um because he was being like extremely creepy and, and I was very scared and um yeah it's like this I don't know when you're in a certain kind of body and you get a lot of attention, it, it starts being, start, it starts feeling um, sinister. Yeah, that stuff is horrible and hard to deal with. And I'm sorry that you've had to yeah. experience it. Um, I'm gonna take us in another direction to, to forget yeah. the sad times online and in person. Um, so we're yeah. here at, in the virtual realm of Harvard Bookstore, uh, a wonderful place that mm -hmm. I have enjoyed buying many books from uh, and doing in-person events, mm -hmm. rest in peace to those. Um, <laughs> so I, I understand you're working on a screenplay about a haunted bookstore. 
and I'm curious while while we're yeah. online and, and any <laughs> ghosts from Harvard bookstore can't hurt us did you ever have a supernatural experience at work and if not tell us your favorite supernatural experience elsewhere Ooh. Well, mostly one day a professor who I had in at Simmons came in and I was like, oh, hey, I know you. And then I was like, can I help you find anything? And she was like, no, and I don't think I'm going to stay in here for long because I just don't like the way bookstores make me feel. And I was like, why? And she was like, don't you feel the spirits in here? And I was like, what? <laughs> and then she was like, there's just so many souls. <laughs> and then I just, yeah, there's... um. I get and then I was like maybe there are there's like it's like a bunch of dead people um and their books and then there is this actually there was this woman who would come in a lot um who I kind of miss and whenever she talked to me I felt like I was being like put under a spell because she had this like ASMR voice and she would always just be like like I was in love with a ghost once and like you uh you're going to and she would like look at me and like tell my future um and then you know then she would like cry and leave it was unsettling um oh my I don't God. know more so maybe yeah <laughs> that's an incredible customer oh yeah yeah <laughs> um yeah I one time my friend told me once that like you know places that are just like frequently um inhabited by people um like the kitchen sink for example um, like if you like leave an energy there, um, and the Harvard bookstore or like any bookstore, people are like in and out of there all the time. So many emotions in and out of there all the time. It's haunted by something. <laughs> yeah. I like the idea that all bookstores are a little bit haunted. I'm going to mm. hold on to that one. Um, okay. So yeah. uh, as a, as a multi-talent, uh, queen of all media i know you're also working on a, a short story collection uh about and i quote mm. from you women who are encountering uncomfortable truths uh were there any uncomfortable truths you had to face while writing dreaming of you whoa um i mean i think i have like um yeah there's been a bunch of people close to me who i've like learned I think, I think that's just the, you know, the way of life too. You learn that somebody you love has done something horrible and then you have to figure out what to do next. Um, and I also, I mean, I think like a bunch of people were like getting canceled while I was um, uh, writing this and I was interested in like the psychology of that and like what happens after somebody gets canceled um cancel culture ah uh, um i don't really care that much but it is it's interesting that at some point everyone was just like yeah and another thing fuck you um and like digging up old posts on the internet um and yeah i mean yeah i think i think that's i think there's more but i i feel like it's hard to describe right now <laughs> Yeah. I think we're going to move to audience Q&A, but I'm going to ask you Ooh. one more question before we do. I read a, a very great mm -hmm. interview with, with you in the Creative Independent, um, but I have to pull one quote where you said, I'm not trying to write tote bag poetry, but I did get a tote bag <laughs> with this book, um, which I love, and I'm going to put all my books in it. <laughs> so I'm curious, in your mind, what would be the perfect piece of poetry merch and then we will go on to to audience q a oh oh my god wow that's really good i think um okay i really think broadsides are are really good poetry merch and i think like pairing up with an illustrator and then like poetry makes such a good comic strip so um i don't know merch that becomes other art i think is cool I think that's a great answer and it leads me you do that with well. wax nine yeah hey well yeah. uh yeah melissa uh. <laughs> uh, very graciously guest edited a, a wonderful issue of my poetry journal this month oh yes um, which you can read at wax9.com 
Uh, an anonymous attendee, yeah. I think that's what they all pop up as, uh, has asked, <laughs> could you talk about the Polly Noor illustration on the front cover? Her work feels so akin to your own in so many ways. I was hoping you might be able to talk about it. Yeah, I am such a huge Polly Noor fan. Her whole thing is like women and their demons. And um, I just, I really love how she draws women's bodies and how she draws like these like skinless creatures. Um, and there's like a illustration of hers in particular that I was like, what? Okay, there's a poem in Dreaming of You where like the shadow self is like sleeping over uh, Melissa and standing over her. And then I saw this drawing that she did where like that is literally happening. And I was like, oh my God, we are connected. Um, and uh, my agent shared a um, thing of hers that she was releasing, I think like a short film. And I was like, I love her so much. And she was like, well, I represent her. And I was like, no fucking way. And I was like, I really want her to illustrate my cover because I think we are psychically connected. And then she did and she, I was basically, I gave her like three um, prompts and I was like, I want like, you know, the like masks and like sleeping Latina girl and mirrors and femininity. And then she was like, I got it. And then she, I don't know. I think my, I think a, my cat is in here. It's really incredible. Um, yeah. Your cat is in there. I love this. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next question. Anonymous attendee. How did you decide to character characterize Yolanda in the way that you did? Did your perceptions of her change as you wrote the book? Um, I think, yeah, I think, my, I think I started writing her because my perceptions of her had already changed. And um, I really felt like I wanted to challenge the way that she's been perceived in this world, which is like, if you kill someone, like, you know, if you kill someone and you obviously kill someone and then you like deny it on 60 minutes, um, it's like, I think maybe you deserve a little bit of flack, a lot of flack. Um, I think I was just so fascinated it's so fascinating when like a when like women kill women um, and when it isn't, um, you know, it was the husband all along, but instead it was the best friend all along, the manager of a fan of her fan club all along. Um, I was really interested in this like power dynamic between the two of them, how Yolanda um, had, was so powerless even though she was older. Um, and maybe that was part of it. She was like this like older woman who, uh, you know, once you get older, you like lose all agency because everything sags or whatever. Um, so uh, in order, but in order to, I like didn't, I didn't really research her that much. Um, I kind of, all of these like empathetic things about her are just like maybe things I've experienced. Um, yeah. My computer hates me. Um, I'm going to co-opt this question to get to one that I didn't get to ask of my own, but we didn't talk at all about queerness and the ways in which you invoked queerness surrounding mm. Yolanda's stories. And I'm curious how those choices were informed um, from your own life or from what you read. Yeah. Give me more. Yeah. Um, well, I think... Uh, someone who was reading this book with me at NYU um, said that this was like peak bisexual girl problems, this book, which is like, do I want to kiss this girl or do I want to um, be this girl? And then in Yolanda's case, it's like, well, it's neither. So I'm going to kill this girl. <laughs> um, and I, I, I'm really interested in like complicated um like women friendships. Um, I'm really, I really loved Passing by Nella Larson and how like the twist in that is lesbians. Um, and I really loved Sula and I really loved um, my brilliant friend. And like this, like, um, you know, this relationship that is so tight and um, close knit and intimate, but never crosses the line of being sexual, but has everything else in there. And um, 
this like platonic romance that can end. Um, so I, yeah, I, I wanted to invoke that in here. And also like, you know, because like the, the you is a, a man and, you know, someone was like, I noticed that the you has he, him pronouns. And I was like, yes, the uh, proverbial you of he, him pronouns. Um, yeah, and uh, I don't know, I'm, I wanted to like be like, okay, this woman has this like gaze on this man, but is so obsessed with this woman. And in much like, you know, her murderer was obsessed with her. Um, yeah, I'm not like a queer scholar though. So I, I feel like, you know, someone else can interpret this maybe better than how I've Then you're it. not allowed to talk today. Um, um, and then <laughs> Uh, okay, we have time for one or two more questions. There's a really good one that I want to make sure we get to that I think touches on what you're talking about. Um, anonymous attendee writes, you've talked a bit about forming the you of your book, but your book also includes a she who is born out mm. of spite, the most fertile feeling. Could you talk about the genesis of she and where she was born for you imaginatively? Yeah. Um... So I was in a coffee shop one day and someone mistook me for um, my now ex's ex-girlfriend. Um, and it was like, oh, sorry, I thought you were somebody else. And that really like shook me. And then I just like, I, we were just like standing next to each other in the coffee shop, like not acknowledging each other. Um, and then I was like, is this like intimate between us? Is this romantic? Um, and then I was like, what happens if I like lose my identity um, and I do become someone else and um, kind of like in this like Little Mermaid way where Ursula comes back and has like the dark hair but looks exactly like a Little Mermaid. Um, so yeah, I, I'm interested. In, I was interested in exploring the like evil side of uh, Melissa that is like always in her but is like really unleashed once um, she brings Selena back from the dead. Um, and you know, how uh, she's this like, you know, catalyst of like bad things that could happen. She's this, um, she's uh, unashamedly um, like chaotic. And I think also that doesn't make it a bad thing. We maybe have those uh, parts of ourselves that we should listen to sometimes. Um, yeah, yes. Okay, there's one more big question, and then I think I can get to the, the tiny questions if, if Harvard Bookstore will allow us. But um, Adrian cool. writes, yeah. when writing about celebrities and obsessions with them, how did you have to go about personally demything Selena during the process of writing Dreaming of You, while also making sure the readers did not mythify her or the narrator? It's a big question. Ooh, good question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I, uh, so a big, uh, something that kind of cracked my image of Selena was, is this like rumor that she was, um, sleeping with her plastic surgeon and she was pregnant and Yolanda, that is a secret that Yolanda knew. And whether or not it's true, I was like, wait a minute, like Selena, that amazing body like doesn't isn't actually like hers naturally or whatever and also she wasn't actually in love with um this guy that she wrote bdbd bd bum bum about what um and uh, so i think i was like wait a minute why is why is that like breaking my heart that's like so random um and then i was like wait she's just like a person and um i really i think also watching these like kind of chuggy older celebs um you know I deeply love Britney Spears her online presence is like is is entertaining unparalleled it's, the best. Un it's unparalleled and I feel like I am I you know all of these like beautiful bright stars eventually grow up to post cringy content on Instagram so I was just like imagining her doing that um, and like also heartbreak, heartbroken that she she can't be embarrassing. So that was how maybe I demythed her. And I think I I don't know. I hope nobody makes a, a myth of me. Um, I think, you know, I tried to be as vulnerable and honest as I could 
in this book, but maybe I'm also hiding behind a wall of fiction. So maybe I'm not being quite honest. Um, and also maybe some people will be upset that I'm not like all the way like honoring Selena as this like beautiful deity. So I don't know. <laughs> All right, fi final uh, two participants, I'm, I'm going to meld into one question. Part A is a, is a request for you to release the soundtrack for people who want to read and listen at the same time. So that's oh, your, hell yeah, that's your homework. Um, part I can part drop B, it in the chat, please do. Uh, semi relatedly, if you could be a Selena song, literally, if you could shed em embodiment and become a song, which song would you be? Um, if I could shed embodiment and become a song. Okay, I don't know what, I feel like if I was a Selena song, I would be dreaming of you um, because I very much relate to the feeling of um, being in love with my own imagination. Um, and so much of that song is like wrapped up in like a death meditation for me maybe where being like one day I'm gonna leave this world um just like she did so uh, maybe that song but then maybe if I could be any Selena song I would be Sio Nevis um because it is very dramatic um and just like fun and um you want to like scream it in a car yeah I'm gonna drop the playlist here Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah. Those are all the questions from from both cool. the audience and from me. But thank you for Sweet. inviting me to chat. I love this book so much. I can't wait to read it again. Thank you, uh, Sadie. Yeah. Thanks. This was so fun. <laughs> thank you so much to to both of you, to Sadie and Melissa. My God, for doing this. Um, and uh, folks, I. Uh, both, I posted the the link to the Spotify playlist, so that should be there uh, in the chat for everybody. And I reposted the link to Dreaming of You uh, to learn more about it and to purchase copies of it at the bookstore. Um, please buy buy this great book. Buy buy it for buy it for your friends. Get it for your enemies and scare them for Halloween. Um, it's it's I yeah I I really. I loved it. I, I, anyway, Melissa, there's a, it was like, wow, there was a, see, this is the part where I'm going to not get, where I'm just going to, we're, we're friends now. But I, there was a, <laughs> when I was in high school, I had a, I had a dream that I like physically like found Jesus crucified. And I was like, my mom's going to be really mad. And I hid him in like the bathroom. He was sort of hidden behind the shower curtain. And anyway, <laughs> I just bring that up because it just the, the, your book is very it's very like that wow dream. uh the sort of spooky dream like thing anyway that is very like that dream <laughs> um <so> thank you <laughs> I loved it um and so folks buy the book thank you so much Sadie Melissa oh. and all of you uh at home please uh How do I, thanks um... so much yeah oh oh let me um okay does that work <laughs> did I did people get the playlist I think I think now probably. Oh, oh, awesome. Okay. Okay, cool. Yay. <laughs> Thank nice you, Nell. Thank you, Absolutely. Sadie. Thank you. Thank you, Thank um, you Wi Fi Ghosts. <laughs> Thank you, always. <laughs> uh, stay safe. Oh, my everyone. God. Horrible. Happy reading. Happy <laughs> Halloween. Too. And Bye. Happy Halloween. Yeah, Happy so Halloween. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.